there's there is a, an approach to talking about that called the I, OSI layer model. Um, if you're real, if you're not a techie geeky person, then it's going to put you to sleep. But the but the point is that what we're talking about, and I'm just using these two physical and logical uh, categories. Uh, uh, the seven layer OSI model is directly applicable to what we're talking about. So if you're a computer person or a network person, uh, all of this stuff will will line right up. And I, I hope that I've made it simple and straightforward enough uh, so that if you're not a tech geeky person, uh, it will still be helpful for you. I want to take a minute and talk about Wi-Fi interfaces in particular. There's a, a very important vocabulary issue here uh, between access points which are things that you connect to and clients which are things that you connect from so your device that you sit in front of whether it's a a um, a laptop or a tablet or a phone um, is a client and access points are the things that you connect to and and there is Honestly, in the marine industry now, in that uh, because Wi-Fi is um, in, it's important, uh, ev all kinds of manufacturers are building things as Wi-Fi access points, and that means that you uh, very often find yourself in the position where you have to connect to an access point in order to get one kind of data, and then connect to a different access point on your boat um, to uh, to access different kind of data. Um, I did a delivery on an absolutely beautiful big um, uh, catamaran, an exquisite 50. And, and we had on that boat, we had no less than eight um, uh, Wi-Fi access points for various and sundry things. We had one uh, for for um, system measurement. We had one for navigation. We had one for boat control issues. Uh, we had one for, I kid you not, for controlling the freezer temperature. Uh, so lot, lots and lots of things on the boat. You needed two iPads in order to fuel the boat because you had to see how the fuel was coming up in the in the tanks on one iPad and on the other one you're controlling the fuel transfer pump, um, pump between the starboard tank and the and the port tank um, and you it and it shouldn't be that way we're we're seeing more and more equipment that uh, works and plays well with others as clients on boat networks so that you connect to one thing and then you can uh, use web page access to uh, to interface with the various things, but we're not completely there that there yet. Uh, I bring this up mostly um, so that you can watch for those sorts of of issues because it's not okay. In my as an engineer, it's not okay for you to have to keep changing access points in order to. Uh, to do all the things that you want to do and connect to on your boat, we're we're getting there. If you're if you're two or three years away from going cruising full time, then my suggestion is for a lot of things to hold off a little bit on on buying too much stuff. Mm -hmm. Get off uh, the dock, go sailing instead. That's yeah. That's Dave, better. Dave, in terms of the Wi-Fi, uh, you know, that is being obviously incorporated into a lot of uh, communication and uh, uh, navigation equipment on, on yeah. modern boats. Um, are there issues with uh, sort of backwards compatibility as the, you know, the, the uh, Wi-Fi has evolved or? No, actually, that, that's a good question. Um, uh, we're, we're really fortunate. There are not a whole lot of, of standards that have been as stable as Wi-Fi is. Um, there are, I'm, I'm not going to remember the numbers correctly, I, I think I do, there are, are 11 global 
Wi-Fi channels and anything you've got that does Wi-Fi supports all of those. Um, Japan has more, there's 17, I think. And there are a couple of countries that, that are somewhere in the middle around 15. <clears throat> but the upshot is you can get off an airplane anywhere in the world and your Wi-Fi is gonna work. It, it, I mean, even your, your cell phone is not that close, but it's not quite that good. And we'll talk about that kind of, of compatibility um, a, a little bit later tonight. Um, but Wi-Fi is actually something that's that's so standard and so common uh, that um, that you can just count on it working. Whether you're sitting in a, a a bar in Singapore or one in the Bahamas or one on Catalina Island, um, it's just going to work. And it's it's almost incredible. There, you know, there's a handful of standards that are so ubiquitous that they really work. World, worldwide, and Wi-Fi is one of those. Um, for future proofing, if you, again by by using these little tool, uh, it puts you in a position where you can. Oh, Dave, uh, let's see. Oh, we, we lost you there for a second. Looks like we've got you back. <laughs> I think I'm back. All okay. right. So, so if you, in, in this case, uh, in, in the little picture on the bottom, um, we've got a, a um, you, you might have a cockpit navigation system that, in implementation, and this is not architecture, it's now design and implementation, that might be um, a, a big Garmin 4812 or something like that, uh, that's got a Wi-Fi connection, but you might also have some old uh, Raymarine SD60 instruments. And so you could have a, one interface out of the cockpit uh, over Wi-Fi that goes to uh, open CPN on a laptop or a Raspberry Pi uh, downstairs at your nav station, and you've also got um, the the ST60 instruments that are connected over hardwired uh, NEMA 183, and that's okay. That doesn't break this model that we're talking about. It just means more things, mm -hmm. uh, more little lines, and, 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 and the little lines are to keep track of of what you've got so that your brain doesn't melt and roll out your ear. <laughs> go, ahead, go ahead, Josh. Yeah, I was gonna say, Dave, uh, Scott Charlson's got a question here for you in the Q&A uh, right. about GUI interface. Um, uh, I'm, re I'm reading it, give me just a second. Um, okay, so um, I've actually, that's a wonderful question. Um, I've, I've, I've actually talked to some manufacturers like Actisense um, about um, making a, a box that can be a client to multiple access points and be a single access point that then passes all that stuff along. That box is not there yet. Uh, it, it, it's probably coming, what's likely to come faster uh, is that the um, marine industry is going to grow up a little bit and and make things that are good clients. Um, there's something called the Internet of Things (IoT), uh, where you know your refrigerator tells you that it's time to buy milk. Uh, your thermostat tells you that um, it's time to buy more fuel oil for your your uh, uh, fuel heater. Um, that that's all coming along. Um, I think the most likely thing for those of us who have things already that um, that have this disparity is that that some some clever technical guy is going to write some code uh, that runs on a Raspberry Pi to do what what we're talking about. 
because what you ask, Scott, is exactly what we should have. It's a single network so that you can access all of the devices from, from one browser. Uh, uh, from Ron, uh, the, the big deal here is that um, radar really is the, uh, the hard thing because there are, uh, there are two ways of getting radar on a, a portable tablet or a portable device, whether it's a tablet or a laptop or a phone, doesn't matter. Two, two ways. One is you just present the data and <clears throat> Raymarine and Garmin and Navico, Navico owns B&G, Simrad and uh, Laurence. Um, they all have tools that let you mirror what's on your MFD. Um, downside of that is that whoever's on and so we it really would be nice to be able to just get the flat get the data across so that you can independently operate that the only people who are at, it's not a very good radar the, the the concept is is brilliant the implementation is um it's not bad but it's kind of mediocre the the resolution is poor um but but we're heading in the right direction so uh, there, there's a lot to be said for getting radar early and getting uh, a chance to get get good at interpreting the imagery data take a class from somebody like Starpath out in Seattle uh, on, on radar imagery interpretation. But um, on the other hand, uh, you might lose the opportunity to get something that really works the way that we're talking about, where you can see anything you want anywhere. And, and if you're laying in your, your bunk, <clears throat> looking at your tablet and you wanna see the radar, and, you, and your spouse or significant other is up in the cockpit trying to zoom in on the chart plotter that you're not working at at cross purposes, trying to change what's essentially a, a shared screen. So we, we're just we're just not quite there yet. Is is the short version. Okay, so um, so protocol conversion is part of what we've just been talking about the brand names that are worth paying attention to in my opinion uh, Actisense is number one they're they're inexpensive they're bulletproof they look like bullets that's the red picture um, digital yacht does some really good stuff uh, Maritron does some there's another one um, uh, down in Australia Brookhouse and uh, uh, they have some kind of supply chain problem that's been going on for years. So unless you can actually put your hand on one, if, if you can get one, they're great. But if, if, you, if you're going to order one, unless you can put your hand on it, I would go with one of the others. Because some of the delivery times have been a year. And that's kind of ugly. It's also worth noting um, that... Uh, Autopilot computers in particular and chart plotters as well very often have multiple protocol um, inputs and outputs. And so you might be able to avoid buying a new piece of equipment by starting at the back of the manual and reading forward till you get to the wiring diagrams and the interface specifications. <clears throat> lots and lots of auto autopilots, for example, um, a Raymarine autopilot um, that's 10 years old has um, uh, CTOC 1, CTOC uh, HS, uh, NEMA 183, all on, on the autopilot. So you don't need to buy a conversion box. Just read the manual uh, and, and see a lot of chart plotters have the same kind of thing. And so you can get those, those conversions. All right, we I mentioned a bunch of brands. These are all the ones that I could think of off of the top of my head. Um, people ask me very often, you know, what should I buy? 
And my answer is, I don't know. The, <laughs> the reason that, that that's the answer is that, that what's most important, because they all work. Yeah. But the reason that that's the answer is that uh, the way the menus are structured, the way that the software people designed and, and built um, may not be the way that your brain works. And so, you know, lots and lots of people like the way Garmin operates. It makes my head hurt. I, 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 I do it. I use them all the time. Um, but it's a little bit of a struggle. Um, Raymarine and Bruno work for me. Navico is just, for me, is just brilliant. So, th so the answer that I suggest is, is the good answer is uh, coronavirus notwithstanding, you know, get, get the to a, a big boat show like Miami or Fort Lauderdale or Annapolis or um, uh, Southampton or um, uh, Stuttgart, one, one, of the, one of the really big ones, or go to a West Marine Superstore, mm -hmm. and like the one that we're fortunate to have here in Annapolis, and just plan on spending the afternoon uh, working with the, the various brands and see which one feels most natural to you. Because what works best for me may not be what works best for you. In terms of actually doing navigation, it really truly does not matter. Yeah. But if, if um, but, but what you want is something that feels natural to you that, so that when um, you come up on deck because um, your significant other or your crew have called for help. Um, it's always going to be three o'clock in the morning. It's always going to be raining and you're always going to be in your underwear and you'd like something that works the way that your brain works. And you're not going to figure that out without spending some time really on top of it. So uh, a PC based um, uh, navigation like OpenCPN, Coastal Explorer, Time Zero, Maxi, has really been a game changer. Things are are um, entirely different now than 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 they have been in the past. That uh, doesn't mean that that dedicated chart plotters don't have a role, particularly with with radar and particularly for weatherproofing and uh, full sunlight display, uh, but having a chart plotter in the cockpit and having a, a laptop based navigation in the at, at the nav station that talk to each other is is really 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 nice to have and, and even if they don't talk to each other I, I just came off this morning so if I if I look a little scruffy uh, I've, I've had a, a week-long delivery and I only got home about about one o'clock this afternoon. So um, so bear with me for being scruffy. And of course, barber shops are closed. So. Hey, you're looking good. Okay, thank <laughs> you. That's very nice of you. Hey, um, um, Dave, we had a couple of questions here. Um, okay. One from Scott again. Uh, he's asking, is there any one in particular that crashes the least? And they all update equally. They all have the same core info. Question mark. Um, good, good question, Scott. Um, now, Raymarine's got the black screen of death that they ran into in the classic E series for a while. Um, Garmin had the random uh, reboot problem for quite a while. Um, oh, jeez, sorry, my. My phone thought I was talking to it. Um, <laughs> um, Bruno's been pretty robust. Uh, haven't really run into a lot of Navico problems, but but they're small, they're minor, um, they're frustrating as all get out. But but none of them are um, are head and shoulders above the others in in terms of performance. What, what was the rest of Scott's question? I'm... Yeah, uh, no worries. So the, the rest of the question was, uh, you know, essentially 
you know, do they all have the same core info? You know, so mostly. Yeah. Um, remember that um, uh, Garmin bought Navionics, mm -hmm. and so they have shifted pretty much everything over to a Navionics base with vector charting. Um, Raymarine has responded by uh, doing more CMAP stuff with with uh, raster charts. Um, NOAA has announced that they're going to phase raster charts out over the next 10 years. Uh, how fast that happens depends on, on the federal funding process. Um, uh, I don't know. I personally like the old fashioned raster charts better. They're easier for me. Um, lots of people think Navionics is the bomb. Again, it, it, you've got to look at it and see what, what it does. Um, Shane, I see Shane's question. Um, um, okay, so uh, he's, he's asking about using OpenCPN and what platform to run that on. Uh, it runs fine on Raspberry Pi. All kinds of people are doing that uh, on Cruisers Forum, um, uh, cruisersforum.com. Uh, the people who write OpenCPN uh, have, a, have a, a sub forum on there and you can read through that and, and see what's going on. Uh, Panasonic Toughbook is pretty expensive. Uh, my, and, and that we're now going from fact to opinion. Okay, so I try and separate those. This is my personal opinion. I really, really like the Lenovo um, uh, ThinkPad T-Series laptops. Uh, the, the one that I'm on actually now is, is, um, is, um, let's see, it's got, it's got to have 50,000 air miles on it and probably 30 or 40,000 sea miles on it. And it just keeps working. Um, and, it, and they're not terribly expensive. Uh, uh, solid state drives are the bomb. Definitely spend the, extra, the little bit extra for an upgrade uh, on that. They boot faster and it's not rotating equipment. So you don't have to worry about dust quite so much. People get confused. They think they, they worry about water on a boat. And the biggest problem on a boat, especially a liveaboard boat, um, is dust. Because every time you move, you generate dust. And so you end up um, um, opening up your laptop once a year and vacuuming it out or, or blowing it out or a combination of too. Um, I'm going to talk uh, for George. I'm going to talk about AIS here in a little bit and splitters. So I'm going to defer that because I've got a slide. Um, and um, and yes, Sim Simrad, BNG, and Lawrence are all owned by by Nabico. And and the reality is that the that the guts of those are the same with different labels on them. Uh, although they've got you know, low, medium, and high um, performance variants of, of those. So, um, um, so I treat Napico as pretty much the same thing. Okay, I talked a little bit about tablets and phones um, and the difference between using it as a repeater where it's, it's just doing the same thing that the that the chart plotter is an independent apps that, that use the data stream so that you can look some, at something different. Uh, re regardless, uh, highly recommend um, uh, having the ability to roll over in your bunk and look at a display to see what's going on and not have to get up in the rain in your underwear and, and look at, at a dedicated chart plotter. I, I still like the dedicated chart plotter for actually sailing the boat, but for situational awareness, uh, keeping track of what's going on, uh, whether you are uh, half of a cruising couple or 
or part of a full crew and being able to see what's really going on without hovering over the people in the cockpit getting in the way uh, it, it's really a tremendous capability and you can do that with um, with most of the newer chart plotters like Garmin and Raymarine and Furuno and, and Navico they've they've got again the, that Wi-Fi access point and they've got apps that you can download to, to look at what's on the screen up there um, and um, so hi highly recommend that Travis I'm going to talk about um, cell phone boosters here in a little bit promise um, got a slide okay so uh, instrumentation there there are two parts of this in terms of thinking and those boxes that we talked about back in architecture uh, one is is the things that describe what's going on outside the boat how deep is the water how fast is the wind blowing what direction is it coming from how fast is the boat moving those are external instruments and and the um, the Raymarine ST60 and the ST60 Plus are, are kind of the, the ubiquitous solution there. But Garmin's got good stuff, and Furuno's got good stuff, and Navico's got good stuff. But that's the external part of things. Uh, the the biggest piece uh, that that I can offer here is that. Um, a couple of things. One is that um, there are newer uh, transducers that go through the hole in the in the boat, bottom of the boat, that do uh, speed acoustically instead of having a little power power excuse me paddle wheel, and the uh, uh, and those are worth their weight in gold because you don't have to keep cleaning the paddle wheel. You, you don't have to, every time you go sailing, you put the paddle wheel in. When you come back, you take the paddle wheel out, and you put the plug in. Uh, the acoustic ones are just great. And if you're starting from scratch, um, I, like buying a Hylus 54 from David Walters Yachts, uh, then you only have to drill one hole for depth, temperature, and, um, and speed instead of two holes. And, and that's just one less hole in your boat. Uh, then there's internal stuff, and this the, these may not be um, interconnected, but but they are part of the electronics on the boat. Uh, there's absolutely positively no substitute for a battery monitor. A voltmeter is not a good indication of state of charge on a on a battery. Uh, a, a battery monitor, which is technically called a Coulomb counter, it, it literally counts um, elements of, of electric charge going past the sensor. Ish. I'm simplifying for effect. Um, really is wonderful. And, and you, you can set that up and, and read the number off and says, we're at 80% state of charge, we're at 50% state of charge, we're at 20% state of charge, and, and you know, that's a bad thing. Um, also worth noting that you can get, on newer engines, you can get um, a fair minute amount of data right off the engine. Uh, the marine engines have the same kind of network uh, uh, and and little computers on them that your car has. Uh, it's called CAN bus, C A N B U S. And and here's something really tricky: the um, uh, CAN bus and NEMA 2000 are essentially the same thing with different connectors. So you can get a really inexpensive interconnect to put all of the, the engine data, oil pressure, water temperature, um, fuel consumption, uh, engine speed on your NEMA network to be accessible from your iPad. And it's just simple. It's just really, really simple. Uh, HVAC R, uh, not really a good reason in, in my personal op opinion. 
uh, despite the sea lark story that I told you a little while ago, where we could log into the freezer and see what the temperature was in the freezer and change the temperature. I don't see a lot of value personally in, in, uh, in interconnecting that, but it does make sense to have uh, thermometers, whether they're inside the, the fridge and the freezer or, or have re remote displays to know what, what, um, what's going on in there. Um, and similarly with water makers, I don't see a lot of value in having that be part of an integrated network, but it sure is nice to be able to, to know what your output is because if, if the output drops at a particular temperature and salinity of outside water, then you know that it's time to either change the pre-filters and clean them, or it's time to uh, go looking for what some other underlying problem might be. Uh, so uh, simple is good, uh, simple is elegant, elegant is robust. I have a, a again, th this is now opinion and not fact. Um, I, I have a preference for staying with a single brand on a boat. Don't much care what the brand is, but if you've got one belly button to stick your finger in uh, when something doesn't talk to something else, that's a lot easier than trying to talk to um, Raymarine and Garmin because your Raymarine autopilot is not talking to your Garmin chart plotter and they're both gonna point fingers at, at, at the other. And to repeat what I said before, the, the user interface UX is, um, uh, is really paramount. So, so buy the stuff that makes the most sense to you and, and not necessarily what some pundit says, including me, <laughs> is, is the one that, that, that you should buy. So, um, and, and that leads to confirmation bias. So w what we see a lot, as, especially on social media, is somebody buys a Garmin and starts saying that Garmin is the best thing since sliced bread because bread because they they just spent three thousand dollars on Garmin instrument or they they just bought Ray Marine or came on the boat and they think it's the greatest thing since sliced bread but they really don't have anything to compare to uh, so people have a tendency to want to justify the decisions that they've made and so you've got to take all of that with a grain of salt. I'd, I'd like to think that that's something that I bring to the table here um, because as, as a delivery skipper in my current career, uh, that puts me in the position where I'm, I'm going from one boat to another and I, and I see and touch all these things. And I will tell you that I don't, other than how easy they are for me to use, um, I don't have a favorite. They all do everything that I need them to do. Um, and, and, and I would suggest that if they do everything that I need them to do, they do everything that you need them to do. So, um, so don't worry so much about which one is the right one for somebody else. Pay attention to which one is the right one for, um, for you. And, and that comes again down to that user interface and uh, uh, and whether it works the way that your brain works. I'm gonna take a second here and catch up on questions. Okay, S Scott, you are full of interesting questions. Um, so Scott asks, how about networked water sensors in every possible incursion point? Uh, I'm gonna digress here for a second. Most of us know somebody who, um, when you ask them what time it is, will tell you how to build a watch. From my perspective, those people are amateurs because I will tell you how to mine the ore, how to smelt the ore, how to machine the, the, the metal into gears, then build the watch, and, and so anyway. So, um, it's an interesting question. I, I think probably from a realistic point of view and something that's, that's 
doable, rather than measure every incursion, possible incursion point, um, if you really wanted to, to worry about it, um, I would do float sensors near bilge pumps. Because what I really care about is, is, is how do I get the water back out again? Um, something else occurred to me with respect to that, and then I lost it. Um, oh, um, alarms. So lots of boats have uh, high water alarms. So you've got, um, you've got what we call in the commercial shipping business, we, you've got a stripping point of stripping pump, which is a very small pump that's down as far as it can go in the little teeniest crack in the in the bilge to get little bits of water out, uh, especially on boats with uh, keel step masts because you've got uh, water coming down the, the mast every time it, it rains. Um, and then you've got a little higher than that, you have a much higher capacity, bigger, um, uh, bilge pump for for pumping things out and then above that you've got a high water alarm and and that's the one from my perspective that I, that if I had um, if I had the option and and, and not sufficiently cost sensitive uh, I would instrument the boat to um, um, to send me a text message if that high water alarm ever went off on my boat when I wasn't on the boat. And uh, and those are available, actually. They're commercially available. They're not terribly expensive. The, the big deal is that it's a, um, uh, that it's it's like cable television. It's yet another subscription that you have to sign up to that, that you have to pay every month. Uh, I don't remember the brand name of, of the company that does, does that. Uh, Josh might. Um, uh, but I, I'm thinking it's like fifteen or twenty dollars a month for for that that kind of support. Um, um, uh, can bus for for Tilo, if I pronounce that correctly. If not, I, I'm sorry. Um, can bus has been around for a really long time. If there is if there is a an engine control computer on on your boat, then it is certainly going to be CAN bus. If you've got an old Perkins or one of the other um, tractor engine type type of engines that has no computer, then there is no electronics. So it doesn't matter. Um, but 20, 25 years, something like that, uh, there's, there's been CAN bus and, um, and Yanmar was an early adopter. So if you, depending on what you have or are looking at, like a, a 4JH2 or 3 or 4, um, uh, it's gotta have a CAN bus connector on it and, and you just plug into it. it. It's just really magic. Okay, so let's talk about communications for a little bit. Um, all right, so again, I'm, I'm, I like the big picture. Excuse me. Um, okay, I'm gonna back up here because um, Dan gets the prize for the best question yet today. So if, if you're, <laughs> if, you, if you are, if you're trying, if you're going simple, um, the single most important um, instrument on the boat is a depth sounder. One, because you'd like to know when you're running out of water, but more importantly, it's a tremendous navigation tool because if, if, if you read your chart and where you think you are has 30 feet of water, and your depth sounder says that you have eight feet of water, then you are not where you think you are. And you need to, to really pay attention to what's going on around you and figure out where you really are. And, and that's where the navigational uh, value of 
of a depth sounder is just absolutely irreplaceable. So that's, that's essential. Um, I like having wind speed and direction. I, I think they're, they've got real value. I'm a little lazy in that respect. It's nice to be able to look down and, and, and look at it. Um, uh, physics is, is our friend here. Um, at 12 knots, the, uh, the wind starts to blow the caps off of, um, off of, of waves. It's, they don't become waves, but, but it blows the tops off. And so you get those little white horses all over the, the, the water. Um, so you know when 12 is, and, and when you get more and more white, it's getting faster. And, um, and for, for most of us who are, are mostly male and mostly older, uh, we're at the point where we know, we've come to accept, that um, uh, we don't actually lose any hair, it just moves around. <laughs> and, so, uh, and so the hair that grows out of your ears, if you pay attention to that and you turn your head so that it feels the same on both sides of your head, um, then you know where the wind is coming from. So, so you can do without wind, speed, and direction uh, with a little experience and some practice, but that's a really, really good instrument. I would put that next. Um, boat speed. Uh, the, if, if, you, if you either keep your paddle wheel really clean um, or you get one of the, the acoustic speed sensors that I talked about earlier, um, then the real benefit of that is that you can look at your GPS speed on a chart plotter or your phone and compare that to uh, the, the, so that's speed over ground, compare that to speed through the water from the instrument on the boat. And, and in some places in the world, um, that makes a, a big deal because you're talking about currents. And so, um, the race at the eastern end of Long Island Sound um, by Fisher Island, um, uh, the C and D Canal between the Chesapeake and the Delaware. Uh, uh, oh, certainly up uh, down East Maine and up into Nova Scotia, where the currents, the tidal currents, get really high. Uh, it, it can really help a lot then to have that. But we're talking about the, that basic. Um, set of sailing instruments. Uh, you, you need to know where you are and you can either do that with paper or you can do that with electronics. Uh, you can spend an awful lot of money on paper and it gets heavy really quick. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a very fast, just checking time here, I'll tell you a very fast story. Um, when I was a contractor for the United States Navy, we were doing something called a SLEP, a Service Life Extension Program for an amphibious assault ship. And, and, the, and the ship had become, literally become unstable. And we went through and did a survey and, and we took uh, about uh, 40 tons, tons of paper off that ship and about 20 tons of floor tile. We peeled up layer after layer after layer of floor tile and then did one new layer. Um, and that ship fights today. Uh, so we didn't have to buy a new ship. I mean, we, big we, the United States, didn't have to buy a new ship. So I'm, I'm not a big fan of paper in, in that respect. If you're gonna go around the world, that's a lot of paper that you have to carry. And so I have a, a predilection towards, towards electronic charting uh, when, the, when the commercial airline industry went all electronic and no more paper, uh, I said, okay, it's time to get with the program uh, and, and do electronics. Uh, so let's see, chart plotter, anchor alarms. Okay, the, the issue with the anchor alarms is that um, it's not the device, it's the operator. The, the big deal is 
that if you drop the anchor and and drop back, lay all the chain out or chain and rope out, um, and then set the anchor alarm. If the wind reverses direction, the alarm's going to go off even if you have not dragged. So if if you set it at the point where the anchor hits the button, hit sorry, hit the button, hits the bottom, uh, then they were fine, and, and they're and they're useful to have. Uh, no, no issue with them. It's it's operator issues, not the. Um, uh, Oops, sorry, hang on. I was trying to uh, run down the, the Q&A and change slides. Um, uh, David, no, no argument, David. David the, um, but you know, the upshot is that there's, um, uh, there are easy protocol converters to get from CAN bus to plug into your engine and, and, and put it on NEMA 2000. And, and it's trivial. They're not expensive. Um, oh, Eddie, <laughs> metal metal boats. Um, <clears throat> so yes, you can get an acoustic depth sounder for aluminum boats. Aluminum boats lead to all kinds of other issues, um, mostly associated with galvanic corrosion. So you have to be really careful about installation and the chemistry of sealants and connectors and the material that you use. So, um, you know, bronze fitting may not be the right answer. You might be better off with Marillon or some other uh, synthetic material. Um, so it, it's, um, that, that's the issue. It, it's not the acoustic part. It's the, the mechanics of the, of the system. Okay, let's talk about communications a little bit. And once again, I'm going to tell you how to build a watch. Um, <clears throat> so here's just a, a mechanism for, and, and again, I'll remind you, you can download all the slides at the end, and then you can, and my email address is at the end, and so you can, you can um, send me notes. This is just a way of thinking about what you're trying to accomplish, uh, because some of us are, um, are going further afield than others. Uh, and so what you need and what's important to you uh, may make a difference. Uh, and, and the thing that, that, that I would like to point out is, um, uh, is GMDS, the Global uh, Marine Distress and Safety System, um, VHF radio and HF single sideband uh, are built into that. If you need to call for help, you push the little red button and and help comes, uh, just like a, a EPIRB, uh, where satellite phones don't fall in that category and certainly Wi-Fi doesn't. Sending the email an email to the Coast Guard over Wi-Fi uh, or, a satellite, or a cell phone and telling them that your boat's sinking and you need help is not recommended. Okay. So what are we trying to accomplish? Most people want to be able to call home um, and you want to call local. So if you're cruising in the Bahamas, for example, um, you might want to call home and see how your parents or your grandchildren are doing. Uh, and you might want to call somebody local because you're trying to get a torn sail fixed or you're trying to find out what the hours are for a grocery store or a restaurant. Uh, in, in these days, email access is ubiquitous and really important to us. And, and I differentiate that from internet access. Email is email. Uh, internet access in my head is, uh, is being able to surf the web and do research and, and get that stuff to work. Um, Another good question from David, I'll get to in just a second, I promise. Um, contact with other cruisers. Uh, there's, there's a social aspect to that, as well as a safety aspect to that. Uh, reassurance to people at home, and, and of course, safety and distress communications. So here's some thoughts. Um, 
uh, one to one communication. You pick up the phone, you dial somebody, you talk to that person that you, you want to talk to. Uh, that's a, a mode of communication. Uh, one to many is often called broadcast. That's what we get with TV. We've got one uh, transmitter that's sending out the nightly news and everybody gets it at the same time. There's no opportunity to provide feedback uh, directly. Uh, Weather facts works the same way. It's a broadcast mode. A lot of shortwave uh, broadcast AM and FM uh, are one to many. Uh, many to many uh, radio nets uh, like a cruiser's net in uh, Georgetown and the Bahamas on on six, on channel VHF channel 68. Uh, conference calls are many to many. Takes a little bit of management there. Somebody's got to be generally got to be in charge so that people don't keep talking over one another. Which is why you all are muted and <laughs> and uh, and Josh and I are the only ones who get to talk. Um, so the question really becomes, what do you want to accomplish and when and where do you need it? And when is really an important question for a number of reasons. Um, if, if you have a vision of circumnavigating the globe and your plan is, uh, and I'm, I'm make, obviously I'm making this up. If, if you live in, um, in, in Boston or Mystic, um, Boston, Massachusetts or Mystic, Connecticut, and your plan is to spend two years uh, doing the snowbird thing up and down the ICW and going to the Bahamas and getting used to things. Maybe the first year you do the ICW and the second year you go offshore from uh, Narragansett, Point Judith to uh, uh, the, the Abacos and, and then you're going to do the Eastern Caribbean and then you're gonna go through the canal, then your long range communication needs, whether you choose satellite or HF single sideband, um, you can defer that for at least two years, if not three. And you'll be smarter and ask better questions and you'll know better what it is that you need to, um, uh, to deal with in order to meet your needs and you give technology a chance to keep going so that things like um, Elon Musk's uh, Starlink um, system have a chance to prove themselves. Because if he's right, if Elon Musk is correct, and, um, and he's built a good system and, and it really works and he can bring it in at a price point that's attractive to people, Starlink will change things. I mean, it will really, really change things for internet at sea. But um, it might not. He might, he might be wrong. He and his team might be wrong. Uh, they've done most of their testing at, from aircraft at 30,000 feet. And so there's, uh, there are spreading losses, R squared losses, uh, that they may not have their arms fully wrapped around yet. Um, the price point may not be something that actually drives sufficient market to be able to keep it going. So it's it's uh, it's an unknown. And and if you're not in a, if, I mean, if you if you want to get off the dock in 2020, which is an interesting thing in the current coronavirus times, because you may not have anywhere to go, but uh, because of closed borders. Um, then yeah, you need to start making decisions now. But if you're looking at 2022 or 2023, then then for high technology stuff like communications, uh, I recommend to people wait until you're about six months out from really getting off the dock, and then and then make the best choice that you can, and and don't beat yourself up over it if it turns out that you missed a little bit. Um, I'm reading Dan's question. Uh, easy answer is n no. Don't worry. Don't worry about about GNS GNSS. Um, 
we've got GPS, we've got GLONASS, we've got the, which is Russian, we've got the European system, China's coming online with their system. They all go fall under the category of GNSS. Um, GPS, realistically speaking, and, and, and not out of patriotism on my part, is the most robust of those. Um, GLONASS is pretty good. Um, uh, the Euro Europeans are still really trying to get things online. China is not quite there yet. So it, it makes sense to me to buy, if you're making a purchasing decision today, buy one that supports as many of those um, component systems as you can, um, but don't stress over it. Um, G GPS is going to be plenty in my opinion. Okay, we're gonna go back to vocabulary here for just a second because people get all wrapped up around uh, what they need, what they think they need. And, and it's, it, it, the magic question to ask yourself is why do you think you need something? So if you think you need a stat phone, the question is why do you think you need a stat phone? What is it that you need? If you need um, your parents' doctors to be able to reach you direct dial at any time, um, then a sat phone's a good solution. Uh, if you have uh, dependents, um, maybe kids in college or, or elderly parents, um, and direct dial may be the, the right way to deal with that, and a sat phone might be a good solution for that. Uh, if you've got business needs at home and you've got uh, and you can't do it over email, um, a satellite phone starts again looking like a really good solution. So just keep asking yourself why until you get to the point where you start sounding like a three-year-old. Why? Why, Daddy? Why can't I do that? Why, Mommy? Why can't I do that? So when you get to that point, you're done. But but up until then. Ask yourself why until you get away from solutions and to requirements, because that will help you open your mind a little bit more and, and consider alternatives that you might not otherwise um, explore. Uh, we talked a little bit about this. Who are you? What are you doing? What do you need? And, and I will point out um, that, that services and stuff are available pretty much everywhere and although it can be a little more expensive to to buy a piece of electronics in Grenada or Trinidad or Tobago or um, uh, Fiji than in Miami or Fort Lauderdale or Annapolis or Sal uh, or San Francisco um, if you keep reading magazine articles and books and listening to people like me, uh, then and you're going to spend four or five years buying things that you're going to rip out because it turns out that you don't really care about having a, um, a combo washer dryer, uh, but you do care about something else. And, and so you've got to take something out, you put something on and you're spending a lot of money. So a, a little bit of extra money when you are smarter because you've been sailing um, is my recommend, my very, very strong recommendation to you. Get off the dock. If you've got a boat that um, is, uh, not to offend anyone, less than pristine, I, my suggestion to you is to, cap, to prioritize the things that let you go sailing. And so if, if that means, you know, one weekend you go sailing and the next weekend you work on projects and then you go sailing and then you work on projects, that's fine. You'll be smarter. The longer and the more often that you sail, the smarter you're going to be about what your needs are. So get off the dock. Okay, 
This is the one that makes your brain melt and roll out your ear. Um, the, the whole point here, this is not the entire radio spectrum, it's most of it. It's from um, uh, three megahertz to 300 gigahertz. The point is that there's all kinds of stuff here. I'm gonna, okay, so, oops, crap, sorry. So um, Josh, is there an arrow that you can see? Uh, let's see here, I think I can see, yep, yeah, we got your mouse. Okay, all right, great. Okay, so, um, oops, shoot, I need to not click it. Okay, so there's all kinds of stuff here. So this big ch chunk of blue, this is the AM broadcast band. Um, uh, down in here somewhere is, um, is Marine VHF. There's the remote control for your uh, garage door opener. Um, down, where am I? Down here. In all this mess is GPS and your um, microwave oven, which is a radio, um, uh, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, all that stuff's down here. So lots and lots of things are radio. Uh, and so this is just a reminder that you're sharing things with a lot of other people. And the reason that you care is um, that if your autopilot turns right every time that you start the microwave oven it very likely is a, a radio interference issue so lots and lots of things are radio and i promise not to there's no quiz and i promise not to show you this thing again okay so let's talk about wi-fi some more um uh as i said it's the the de facto standard for local data um it's a line of sight thing. Uh, a, a good antenna or, or booster really helps. I have a preference. I'm gonna tell you what it is here in a minute. But independent of that preference, uh, for, for us, because we go out and we anchor somewhere or you, you pull into a marina and you're in a slip and you don't really know what the orientation is gonna be, you want a, a system that in the uh, in the horizontal plane, the, the left picture there uh, is more or less omnidirectional, but in the vertical plane, it'd be nice if it um, had some directivity so that you're not uh, working on signals that go up into the sky or down into the water. And this is how you get gain out of a um, omnidirectional antenna. And this is the same thing that, that you get with a VHF antenna on your masthead. Exactly the same physics, exactly the same in engineering. Um, so uh, the important piece, however, when you connect to something, and this also happens on cellular, not, not just on Wi-Fi, uh, is backhaul. So you can have uh, a whole bunch of people with really fast connections over cellular or Wi-Fi to, to the access point or the cell site. Um, but if the backhaul that actually connects to the internet is a, uh, a 1.5 megabit per second T1, uh, it doesn't make any difference that, that you're talking to the lo your local connection at 54 megabits per second if, if the backhaul is slow and it's shared among a bunch of people. Uh, uh, Dirk, good question. I'll get to that, I promise. It's another great question. You guys are good. Okay, so um, here's a picture of, of one of the range extenders. Uh, this is a red port halo. Um, the halo is nice because it comes with both a, um, an, an, a range extender, which is this part, and, uh, um, and the optimizer, which is for Wi-Fi distribution inside the boat. Um, it's a little clunky. The interface can be a little awkward. It takes some getting used to. My personal preference is the Ubiquiti Bullet. Um, 
and I use a uh, uh, Cisco Linksys WRT54GL for the inside of the boat part. Uh, if you are planning full-time cruising and doing a satellite phone, then send me an email because there's some other um, uh, options that let you uh, make life easier to go between Wi-Fi and cellular and, um, and satellite. But it, we, I don't think we, yeah, we don't have time to go into that, that detail. Uh, there is a guy down in Florida, um, near in Tampa, I think, uh, Bob Stewart at a place called Island Time PC. Highly recommend Bob. Uh, he sells uh, systems based on the Microtech Groove. Uh, it, the, the Groove is uh, pretty much as good as the Bullet. A little, a little simpler, um, uh, a little cheaper. But the real deal with Bob is that his level of customer support is truly second to none. Just, it's just fantastic. Um, so I, I got out of business of selling these things because um, Bob was so good. <laughs> and that's all he does. I do a lot of things. This is all he does. Uh, it, it's worth, worth going to Bob. Um, and you can roll your own if you want to. Um, the little uh, extenders that just plug into USB on, on a single computer like the Alphas, um, better radio than the, than the Wi-Fi radio built into your laptop. Uh, and they do make the difference between having to sit in the sun and worry about your uh, laptop battery uh, running down when you're at a beach bar and being able to sit in the shade near a power outlet and still be able to get a good connection. And, and I have one of these in my, my laptop bag, but not what I would suggest for uh, your main boat system. The, the, the bullet, the halo, and the groove are really the way to go. Um, so that just, these are just a couple of pictures. Uh, Island Time PC is Bob Stewart, who I think very highly of. Uh, and, and, and the really nice thing about these is that uh, one person, one time from one device makes the connection from the uh, range extender to whatever access point there is on, on shore. And everybody else just connects to uh, the in the boat uh, Wi-Fi, and so you you don't have to keep doing the the big shoreside connection over and over again. So that's that's what I recommend. Recommend an Alpha is like thirty bucks. Uh, buy one for when you go ashore, uh, so that you can sit where you want to sit near a near a power outlet, um, a a bullet or, or or one of Bob's grooves for fixed installation. If you um, if you are a techie geeky person, there's the opportunity to get your uh, chart plotter on, on the same network, and that makes it easier to do uh, chart plotter updates from the manufacturer. Otherwise, you end up having to download it onto an SD card and, and then move the SD card from your laptop to the chart plotter and go through all the steps on the chart plotter, not the end of the world. Uh, I generally use um, five gigahertz Wi-Fi uh, is not very good for for range, um, and that that that's okay. That's a that's good news. Uh, so I use five gigahertz inside the boat and two point four gigahertz Wi-Fi outside the boat for the connection to shore. So we've got two point four from the boat shore, five gigahertz inside the boat. Turn off two point four so that you don't end up shouting in your own ear um, by having 2.4 running around inside the boat. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, phones, <clears throat> there, there are two big technologies here. One is GSM, 
uh, which in the United States is what AT&T and T-Mobile use and most of the rest of the world uses. Uh, CDMA is Verizon, Sprint, uh, most of China, all of Japan, parts of Korea. Um, we'll talk about what the implications are. Uh, the US uh, uses uh, 850 and 1900 megahertz frequency bands for cellular. Um, most of the rest of the world uses 900 and 1800 and, and that, those four things are what lead to what you um, read about, hear about from people saying you, got, you have to have an unlocked quad band GSM phone, that's why, is, is those four things. Uh, 2100 megahertz, mostly global data, uh, we're going to talk about that next slide. Excuse me. Um, I'm going to talk about carrier locks. 2G, 2.5G, 3G, 4G, LTE, 5G is coming. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that. You go to bigger numbers and it's faster mostly, but not always. Okay, LTE, the good news is that uh, we've actually got a global standard for LTE. Um, GSM and CDMA are collapsing into wideband CDMA for LTE. Uh, the bad news is fallback is still different. What, that, what does that mean? That means that if you've got a Verizon phone and you go out into the out islands in the Bahamas, for example, then um, if you're close to a tower and can get an LTE connection, then it'll work, um, but an AT&T phone will fall back to uh, 4G or 3G and your Verizon phone will fall back to no signal. Uh, so for, for, for uh, uh, cruisers that really leave the United States, uh, AT&T's got a lot more flexibility. On LTE, both AT&T and Verizon will work better uh, I'm sorry, will we'll work. Um, both will work better, either will work better than T-Mobile or Sprint and certainly better than, than the resellers. It, it, it just is. Um, the problem is that um, LTE has 22 band. We talked about quad band a minute ago for GSM. Uh, LTE has 22 bands across the planet. The um, the good news part of that is that there are like eight or nine that are actually commonly used, but it, it does mean you have to keep the, the spec sheet for the phones that you choose in hand. And so that if you, uh, if you leave the Galapagos heading for Fiji, then it's worth a few minutes to look up what is going on on, on cell phones in Fiji. In the near term, uh, you're good with GSM. It's, it's just gonna work. Um, in the long term, if you're four or five years out from the South Pacific, um, that could change. And, and so you just need to have one more thing to pay attention to. Uh, 5G is coming. Um, there are two kinds of 5G. Uh, the 5G that's being promoted now, today, excuse me, is, um, is really uh, LTE on extremely mild steroids. It just doesn't make that much of a difference in terms of speed or connectivity. Um, the really fast stuff where they talk about mobile, true mobile internet at really high speeds is only going to work in in urban areas because the range for a millimeter wave is just so short so um, for us for cruisers it just doesn't make sense to spend extra money for a device that um, that has 5g on it because it's not going to do you any good in 
most of our cruising grounds. Eastern Caribbean, the Bahamas, Bermuda, the Azores, um, Southampton Water, English Channel, uh, Skagerrak, uh, Southeast Asia. We're just not going to see the benefits of millimeter wave 5G. There may be places where if you buy a, a phone that supports 5G, it says 5G on it, um, but you're not going to get the speed benefits that you get from millimeter wave. And that's really the issue. I talked about lock, locked and unlocked phones a little bit. Um, here's the deal. This, in simple terms, the, um, the carrier, the people that you probably bought a phone from, um, subsidize the price of the phone, and they justify that uh, from an accounting point of view by distributing uh, the cost of the phone over the two-year contract term. Um, and so it's it's carrier locked. And so even if if you change the SIM card to another carrier, it it won't connect because it's locked to the people like T-Mobile, for example, that that you bought the phone from. Uh, there are a couple of, there are a couple of things you can do about that. I mean, one thing you can do about it is get it unlocked. Um, a couple of ways you can do that. There are unlock online resources cost about $20. Um, some of the performance is, is up and down. Um, what I have both personally and my, my customers had great success with is if you, if you call your carrier and you say, hey, look, I'm not trying to get out of my contract. I'm going here, there, and somewhere else. And I'd like to unlock my phone so I can put a local SIM in when I get to the Bahamas, and then when I come back to the U.S., I'm going to put my AT&T SIM card back in. If if you're um, if you're kind and polite um, and um, stick to your guns, you can usually get an unlock code for free from the carrier, and that really works uh, tremendously well. Um, if you do need to buy a, a sort of a solution. Uh, free cycle, Craigslist, eBay, uh, same thing for buying older quadband um, GSM phones. Um, SIM cards you buy uh, pretty much anywhere. You can walk into a phone store in the, in uh, Marsh Harbor in the Abacos, Bahamas, or uh, or uh, Roadtown in Tortola. Uh, BVI or Martinique or uh, pretty much anywhere and get a prepaid SIM card that just works in your phone. Uh, if you are a dedicated Verizon person and you're heading to major tourist places, very often Verizon has a CDMA tower. Uh, there's one in Nassau in the Bahamas, for example. There's one in Roadtown in, in Tortola in the B if you've got a high-end, higher-end um, smartphone, iPhone or a Sam, uh, one of the Samsungs, um, they're often multi-mode. You've just got to read the spreadsheet, the spec sheet, uh, and see how that goes. Um, oh, Google, Google Fi. Um, uh, Google Fi is not its own network. Google Fi is a contract between Google and a number of networks. And it's based on um, the presumption that you are US based and not, um, and not traveling a lot. Certainly not a nomad in that respect. The um, so uh, Google as a company is really good at writing software, and there and there's software that supports um, Google Fi and the accounting for that, so that they make money is getting better and better and better. And so they're they're now at the point where they are really keeping track of your individual usage, so that if you're roaming costs 
that that they Google have to pay because Google Fi is a um, is a flat rate arrangement. Um, if your roaming costs that Google has to pay to uh, phone systems in other countries uh, become consistently becomes higher than uh, what they're getting from you, then they they flat turn you off. You, know, you get a text message that says uh, you have failed to comply with the terms and conditions of your contract, and um, and until you get back to the United States and use your phone consistently in the U.S. for a while, then your phone won't work. So, not necessarily a good solution for um, for a, a world cruiser. If if you're a snowbird who's going to um, the Bahamas um, every year for two or three months, and then you go back up up the U.S. East Coast. Um, it, it can work. Um, My Island Wi-Fi uh, is probably, a, in the end, a better solution uh, because as, as long as you can use voice over IP, so voice over, over data like Skype, Skype or WhatsApp, um, then, then that, that's probably an even better solution for the Bahamas because they only do the Bahamas in Florida right now. Um, I would... Um, uh, I am going to talk about AIS here in a minute. Um, okay, I, I think I hit Google Fi. Um, uh, okay, I've got another. Oh, okay. So, um, if you're using Wi-Fi for connection, um, uh, VoIP, voice over IP, makes a lot of sense. Um, here's the really stupid, simple answer to what should I use? Um, generally speaking, um, people are trying to get a hold of their grandchildren. And uh, so you just use whatever the heck they're using. If they want to use WhatsApp or they want to use um, uh, Viber, then just use that. Don't try and talk them into something else. You want to use what they're using so that when you do have a connection, um, you can see whether they're online or not. You can talk to them. So trying to convince your grandchildren to do something different is not a great path to success. Um, so just let them take the lead and, and you'll be better off. Do be aware that if you're using Wi-Fi, um, a lot of the systems like Skype are filtered now by access points. What that means is that because um, people are sitting around, in our case, sitting around in anchorages, doing trying to do video teleconferencing with their grandkids, um, the shoreside access points, uh, the people who own those and who are paying for uh, by the bit internet connectivity, um, are are starting to filter that stuff out. So. Um, Cellular works better. Again, Bahamas, where so many people go and so many people go cruising long term, um, My Island Wi Fi is really the way to go for that. And again, that backhaul issue that, that we talked about before. Um, you can get a free telephone number from Google, uh, Google Voice. Um, the nice thing about that is that you can add and drop numbers online. Um, if some, it doesn't always work. Uh, outside of the United States, it depends on the phone system. Uh, but regardless, you can get voice to text to a local number. And when you do have an internet connection, uh, you can uh, look at all, you can look at and listen to all of your voicemails. So it really is quite convenient. Um, and it's free. Um, Okay, so before I talk about this next one, I wanna catch up on a couple of questions that are lingering here. Um, going back to radio stuff, there was an uh, excellent question from somebody who I've lost track of um, about LED interference. Uh, the issue there is really not the LEDs, it's the power supplies uh, for the LEDs that are built into the package, but you and I don't really care why it's being a mess. It, 
it, it, it can be a mess. Uh, lots of issues with HF single sideband interference from LEDs, uh, some with VHF. Um, it's worth getting good, um, good quality uh, LEDs. You, you do get pretty much get what you pay for, especially if you're going to convert your anchor light and and or tricolor where it's right up next to your VHF antenna. Um, uh, spend the extra for the good stuff. Um, quite a good, a good question. Another good question from uh, from George on um, on lightning. Um, oh, I could spend an hour talking about lightning. Let me try and make this short. Um, tens of thousands of volts and hundreds and thousands of, of amps from, from a real direct lightning strike. And uh, all of the, the cool little green wires and bonding systems and the, and the little fuzzy um, uh, dissipator at the masthead possibly some value in um, uh, reducing uh, static electricity that builds up at the masthead that might, science is not there to prove this, um, reduce your chance of, of being hit in the first place. But if you are really hit, as opposed to a hit that's 100 meters away, that hits the water or another boat or something. Um, uh, if you're really hit, all those little wires and things, the, the electrical engineering term for those is a fuse. They melt. Um, the hull melts. You get these little pinholes in the, in the hull that water comes in. So it, getting hit by lightning is bad. Um, and there's not a lot that you can really do about it other than uh, be somewhere else. Um, there's a guy in Florida, I forget his name, uh, but he sells a lot of systems. He uh, is a, he works at the University of Florida, either, either University of Florida or University of South Florida, I don't remember. Um, but he's also got an outside business that sells this stuff and sells consulting and sells, um, sell, 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 sell. So you have to take what he says with a grain of salt because the, the real science doesn't really back up what he says. Um, the state of Pennsylvania um, did a study with, uh, with UPenn about 15 or 20 years ago, they did uh, on half half the bridges in the state, they put lightning uh, dissipation systems on and the other half they did not. And what they found was no statistically observable difference between using the dissipation systems and the, um, and not. And, and those guys were using you know, really big wire. We're, we're not running, you and I are not running double zero wire up the mast. Um, they, were in, they were doing some big stuff. And so um, if, if somebody's found science to the contrary, uh, I would love to hear about it. But um, um, from what I've seen, uh, there's, there's no real uh, virtue to pretty much anything other than don't be where the lightning comes down, <clears throat> which is um, which is kind of too bad. It'd be nice if there was a really good answer. Okay, so um, jeepers, I got a lot to talk about yet. Okay, mobile phones um, uh, for data. Um, you have to the, the big the big deal here is that you do have to pay attention to uh, whatever the the data caps are for your your particular account. Um, this is where things like my island Wi-Fi 
really shine because they're unlimited. Uh, I like the little separate uh, uh, data, data sticks, um, mostly because you can get some that, uh, like the one that's pictured here, that have an external antenna port on them. So you can put a antenna jack, uh, plug into the antenna jack and have a antenna up high uh, to in increase range. They're generally better radios than the radios in your phone as well, so that helps. Uh, somebody asked earlier about um, uh, cell phone boosters. There are two basic categories here. One is a repeater. It, it's a um, it's essentially a mini cell site and so you have to put a sim card in it which means that you have to have another account from somebody either local or at home and that connects to the um, to the cell system and and then your phone connects to it. Uh, the alternative is uh, is a, a booster, um, which just takes a big hunk of frequencies. Uh, uh, the WeBoost uh, 4GX is a great one. The only problem there is frequency coverage. It does um, 850 megahertz band and 1900 megahertz band, so it's, it's great in the US, Canada, Mexico, um, Bermuda, Bahamas, uh, and Eastern Caribbean. But if you go through the canal and head south, um, you're going to need another piece of hardware. And I don't have a recommendation for Europe and the South Pacific because I haven't found one that really works. Um, if you're going to do the snowbird thing, uh, coverage in North Carolina and parts of Georgia can really be spotty. Uh, I just, the delivery, I've, I've mentioned a couple of times that I just came off of, we spent oh, eight, nine hours going through North Carolina um, with no cell coverage at all. And most of that's based on topography because the, the, the water is where the water is and then the, there are hills on both sides. So the, the guy on, the, on his deck behind his house looked looking at, at you has got two or three bars and you um, 30 or 40 feet lower than him have nothing. So uh, these systems, not only are they better radios and, and, and better antennas, uh, but because you can get the antenna mounted up on a spreader, then uh, you get better line of sight and, and it and goes on. So if you're, if you're trying to do work or you really got, you know, somebody's got to be able, absolutely positively has to be able to call me and I can't accept rolling the voicemail and calling them back later today or tomorrow, um, then, then this is a good solution to that. And hang on. Oh, and John, my friend John McDougall is here. Um, uh, John uh, KA4 WJA um, <laughs> and he remembered which which school it is and gave the link to him uh, to the guy um, um, I have no argument with with what what John wrote there at all um, ex except I will repeat that um, tens of thousands of volts and hundreds of thousands of um, of amps and and we just don't have big enough wires to get all that into the into the water if you really take a direct hit that's that's different from a nearby lightning stroke strike and and the um, and the pulse uh, otherwise we're talking about just really really big wires and, and it, stupidly big wires so, um, but thanks John and uh, really really glad you're here uh, you keep me honest okay so uh, carrier recommendations if you're staying in the United States 
uh, Verizon still has a very small uh, edge over AT&T for coverage. If you are leaving the U.S. doing the Bahamas, Caribbean, rest of the world, um, then AT&T is a better home phone. Uh, ge in general, um, again, Verizon's got a little bit better coverage in the U.S. Uh, AT&T, when you can get AT&T, tends to be a little faster. That's my experience. Um, and uh, on delivery, you know, the, my crews have whatever they have. And so we have a chance to do side-by-side -side comparison fairly often. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not reading this off of something. This is guys sitting in the cockpit saying, you know, okay, you do a speed test and I'll do a speed test. And you do a speed test and we'll see what works. And, uh, at and tends to be faster. Verizon tends to have slightly more uh, better coverage. Um, uh, nobody else keeps up. T-Mobile, Sprint, um, uh, uh, Cricket, uh, whatever the Walmart company is, just just simply not the same. Um, David asks about multi hulls and lightning strikes. I, I don't. I don't get that. I don't get. I don't see any any science to to multi hulls being more susceptible. Um, John might be aware of something that I'm not, but uh, we're really talking about masts, not not the boat. There's just no good reason for a multi hull being a higher risk. Okay, so um, for all of this stuff, there's an update problem. Windows wants to phone home. Mac OS wants to phone home. Android wants to phone home. Um, your iPhone wants to phone home. All your apps want to update themselves. So you, you need to plow. How through for um, a cell phone connection or paying by the bit for a satellite phone or or for a Wi-Fi connection, then um, you you need to do the work to figure out um, how to tell Windows not to keep trying to update. It's still going to ignore you sometimes. It's just a pain in the behind. Um, because the, the people in Redmond, Washington, think they're smarter than we are and, and know better than we do what's good for us. But we, you, can, you can throttle it back. Um, if somebody's really going long-term cruising in the very near term, send me an email and I'll send you links to the instructions for how to do that. Um, but it, it's, it's really a problem. Please remember that most of this electronic stuff, it's not waterproof. Some phones are, most stuff is not. Um, I'm a big fan of the seal line products, the picture here. Uh, you get in the dinghy, you put your, your, your wallet, your money, your phone, your tablet, maybe your laptop into a waterproof bag and you go ashore and, uh, uh, and and that there is where you do the the big updates on um, on your devices, not over the cellular connection or or the very expensive satellite connection. I want to take just a minute on licensing here. Um, this is a little this is a little uh, awkward for Americans because we're used to the fact. That we have a waiver for um, VHF radar and EPIRB. But you're really supposed to have, for long range communication, you are supposed to have a station license for the boat and you're supposed to have an operator's permit for crew. Um, there's no testing associated with either one of these. They are, um, you just pay your money to the government, to the FCC, and you, and you get your license. Um, but if you've got any long, if you got either a satellite phone or a 
uh, HF single sideband radio, you're supposed to have both a station license and, and at least one person on the boat is supposed to have an operator's permit. Um, when my wife and I first um, started being serious about one another, uh, I bought her an operator's permit for Valentine's Day one year. Uh, fortunately, there were chocolate and flowers as well, or she would not have taken that particularly gracefully. Um, but, but I thought it was an indication that <clears throat> I didn't think she was going anywhere and I wanted her to be part of the team for the boat. Um, anyway, uh, my warped sense of humor. Uh, worth noting that um, you need a MIMSI number, MMSI. Uh, that goes in your VHF radio. It goes in your uh, HF SSB radio if you've got an 802 or the new 803. Um, and that identifies the boat. You can get them for free from Boat US, from CETO, from US Power Squadron. I think there are four or five other places you can get them from. Uh, you can tell a uh, an FCC MIMSI uh, because they all end in zeros, and the ones from the from the free alternatives um, end in an, in another digit. Um, the station license is good for ten years, and a radio operator's permit is good for life. Okay, VHF radio, just quickly, short range, line of sight. Um, Big deal is DSC. That's the little red button that you push when you get in trouble. That goes out over what used to be Marine VHF Channel 70. Uh, AIS uh, goes over what used to be Marine VHF Channel 87B and 88B. Uh, lots of people um, buy an AIS and put a splitter in between um, the AIS and the voice VHF and the antenna so that you can share a single antenna. I'm not a fan of splitters. Uh, there's some signal loss in both directions. Um, the real big deal that I have is that if they fail, uh, then um, the, the a your AIS can yet be yelling in the ear of your VHF and your VHF can be yelling in the ear of your AIS and you can um, do some damage. Um, burnout front ends um, doesn't happen a lot but if you are uh, long-term cruising in my opinion not, not a great a splitter is not a great idea you're better off putting the AIS on its own independent antenna uh, on a spreader on a radar pole uh, on the push pit rail um, somewhere else Strong opinion on my part. Um, HF single sideband radio, uh, global reach. You can talk to people all over the world. Uh, installation is um, fairly simple and straightforward, but there are a lot of ways to really mess it up. And so you, you want to get advice from somebody. Um, John, um, uh, in particular, has been uh, ex extremely um, vocal, <laughs> I'll say, on the subject uh, with, with lots of good stuff. So if, if you, I don't have a link in, the, in my slides, but if, if you do an internet search on KA4WJA, um, Kilo Alpha 4 Whiskey Juliet Alpha, um, you'll find his posts about single sideband radio and, and his advice is good. Um, Gordon West is another name that comes up fairly often. Uh, Gordon has changed his tune over time, but it's um, it's easy to stumble across something that he wrote 25 or 30 years ago, and, and he's changed his mind and, and agrees with people like John and me about what the right answer is. So you have to be careful about um, reading, especially reading Gordon's older books. Um, I want to take a minute here for an advertisement for ham radio. Uh, there are two pieces here. One is that uh, there's really nothing other than some minor regulatory stuff um, that um, 
that you need to know to get your ham license that you shouldn't know anyway in order to be a self-sufficient cruiser. So I highly recommend getting a ham license. The second piece and, and the second reason is that um, when you when you just use the marine bands for HF single side band. Uh, there's some great nets out there, Kreisheimers and and the Dudon net on the U.S. East Coast, Domingo out on the on the West Coast. Uh, but you're talking boat to boat, and on the ham based nets, um, the waterway radio net, um, maritime mobile service net, uh, Pacific Seafarers. What you've got is generally you've got a whole bunch of people who have been cruising and then gone home and they're sitting on a farm in Tennessee or Michigan or somewhere with lots of real estate, big antennas, lots of electricity. So they've got very high power radios. Um, uh, and those guys, they, they live vicariously to, um, to help us. Uh, just absolutely positively fantastic resource. And you can't take advantage of that without a hand license. So I, I had guys on the waterway net when I had a family member who um, uh, fell ill while I was offshore. Um, and I got daily updates from, from them. <clears throat> um, and they were just wonderful. They were, um, they were making all the phone calls and collecting data and passing that to me during the net. And you're not going to get that any other way. So sorry to be a little, little uh, soft on the subject. He died. Um, so okay. So a little thing, just a quick thing on propagation. Um, the it's it's more complex than this, but in simple terms, the signal goes off from your antenna, and and the reason that we get global reach is that that it bounces off of a layer in the ionosphere and then comes back down again. And, and especially over water, it's not uncommon for it to bounce off the water and go up and bounce off the ionosphere again and come down. So, um, and this, this is what happened um, when I was 14 years, and it's, it's a regular thing. And it, it, it really does cycle with sunspots, uh, <laughs> which is kind of entertaining. Uh, nothing to do with aliens or spacecraft or anything like that. But, but sunspots are for real. Um, when I was 14 years old, my very first uh, contact over ham radio um, was sitting in uh, Arlington, Virginia. And, and I talked to somebody in the Cape Verde Islands uh, off of the uh, Northwest African coast. So you, tremendous range, opportunity. Um, some legal issues. Uh, you really need type acceptance for being on the marine bands. There's more flexibility for the ham bands. That means that um, getting a, a marine radio like an ICOM 802 or the new 803, um, and um, and it's a it's a front panel keyboard thing to to open that up for uh, access to the ham bands is a better solution and a more legal solution than modifying ham radio to talk on the marine bands. In an emergency, you can do, you can use anything anywhere to get help. And it's, and that's fine. That's legal. Um, I, I carry the, the um, aircraft frequencies for commercial aircraft, for example. Uh, and Sometimes I just listen to them because it's fun and I don't have anything else to do and I'm in the middle of the ocean. Uh, the reason for type acceptance uh, is that uh, voltage swings are, uh, well, the radio is made to be robust for life safety um, service, which is the GMDSS stuff that I talked about earlier. So if your batteries get down to 10 and a half volts, um, a marine radio will still work. And if if, uh, if they go up to 14 and a half volts because you've put lithium batteries on and, and you've upgraded your uh, all engine alternator and it's 
charging the heck out of your lithiums, uh, it's still going to work. Uh, and the signal characteristics are, are going to be pure so that, or purer, so that you're uh, not going to uh, be interfering with people on adjacent channels. Uh, there is an, an option to dip your toe in the water and certainly something you can do at home. Um, the one in the middle is, is the one that I now carry on my um, blurry trips to get weather facts. Uh, it's about $120, I think. Uh, don't, don't try and get anything useful out of the little antenna that, that's, that's on these portables. Um, you want a portable that does single sideband and that's got an external antenna jack so that you can put a lot of wire up as high and clear as you can in the, um, uh, in order to get a better signal. And WeatherFax is really um, one of the, the most tremendous opportunities there. For HF radio, um, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm embarrassed to say I forgot to update this one. The ICOM 802, M802 um, had, had and has a uh, FCC uh, issue. Uh, it's still a great radio. It's just a legal thing. And if you've got one, you're fine. It's just you can't sell them in the United States anymore. Um, ICOM has a new radio that's available in other parts of the world. It hasn't, been, hasn't gotten through. FCC of approval yet. Um, so if, if you're shopping for HF, then um, drop me an email and I'll, I'll help you. Uh, Pactor modem for, for email is really the gold standard. Uh, it's a single source from SC, a, company, a German company called SCS. Uh, you can connect to sale mail, to commercial services, uh, sale mail crews, email and shipcom. Um, you can connect over ham radio through Winlink. Um, there are, you, you may find if you are being frugal, uh, some Pactor one alternatives, but they're, they're really not viable. They're so slow that um, uh, a lot of the shore stations don't even uh, support them anymore. Uh, there are some options through amateur radio that don't require any hardware at all. You, they use the sound card in your your computer, uh, PSK, Winmore, uh, RDOP, uh, there's a, there are a couple of, of others. Uh, they, they tend to be slower than the, than the hardware solution. Um, okay, uh, I, I see your question, Char uh, Scott, I'll, I'll get you. Uh, it's worth noting that we're talking about stuff that's really slow here. Um, uh, note that you know, here's Iridium at 2400 bits per second. Here's Pactor 4 over HF single sideband at 10.5. Um, they all use the same, essentially the same compression algorithms to get higher effective throughput, but um, HF single sideband with a good modem is, is, is still the, the gold standard. Uh, uh, Okay, so John, let me, um, so the easy answer to your question is yes, you can. Um, I, I don't remember whether I've got a slide on this or not, so I'm just gonna tell you. Um, what I do is um, uh, offshore is use weather facts. There's, there's a magic document. If you Google for rfacts.pdf, uh, Romeo Foxtrot Alpha X ray dot PDF. And one of the top three responses from Google is going to be uh, a NOAA website. Uh, download that document. That gives you all the times, all the products, all the frequencies for weather facts. Um, the, the only even mildly tricky bit is the cable between the portable uh, radio, shortwave radio, and your computer. The, uh, and the, the reason it's mildly tricky is that, that there are the more, more and more laptops, and certainly phones and tablets, 
uh, have those little four conductor plugs that you see on the earbuds for a, a, um, a smartphone. And if, if you get to that point, again, send me an email and, and I'll, I'll walk you through that. It, it, it's not that hard if you can solder or, you can, or if you can find somebody you can solder to build one yourself. Um, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm not doing this in order to try and sell anybody anything, but I will make those cables for people. Um, it takes me 15 minutes and I've got parts and stuff. So I charge $25 for that, but, uh, but you can do it yourself and I'm more than happy to help you do it yourself. Um, and I use a software product that's also free called JVCom32. Um, there's another free software called multi PSK uh, that works as well. Um, it's just so ugly that I can't stand to run it on a regular basis. The, uh, the Pactor modems have a built in hard hardware good. Uh, satellite phones are a different thing. I, I'm going to take a second here and, and make sure that I haven't missed anything. Um, okay, so let me, okay, so we're going to start talking about satellite phones here. So I'm going to talk about Starlink. Starlink is coming. Um, there's no question that it's coming. Um, it's likely going to be faster. We don't know how much it's going to cost. Uh, all of the speed data that I'm aware of that uh, that SpaceX has advertised is based on tests with aircraft at 30,000 feet. And it's not going to be as fast uh, on the surface of the water. It's just not. Um, R squared spreading losses there. Um, but again, the world is, is changing. Physics is not changing, but the world is changing, technology progresses. And so if you're four or five years away from actually going internationally cruising, then I would hold off and see what happens and how it shakes out rather than, than buy something now. Uh, the other thing like Starlink that's coming is Iridium Next. Um, faster than base Iridium, uh, all new hardware, uh, which uh, means that if you buy an Iridium Go today, then you're not going to get the speed benefits of, of Iridium Next. And so, again, unless you're throwing off the dock lines today and going through the Panama Canal and heading to the South Pacific, I would hold off a little bit and see what happens in the next year or so. Um, and thank you, John. John. John did the link to the rfax.pdf document. Thank you. Um, question from Scott, uh, backtracking a bit. Um, the, um, there, there's a little bit of a religious issue about using uh, tablets as uh, primary navigation. Uh, does it work? Yes. Um, the issues are um, uh, water tightness, because they're not. Um, and no matter how dry you think your boat is in the cockpit, there's a very good chance that it's going to get trenched at some point. Um, power, uh, how long does the battery last? What do you have to do to, uh, to get power to it, to charge it? And what does that do to watertight integrity? And um, uh, the last one is display brightness. You can't get it bright enough so that you can see it in direct sunlight. And you can't really get it dim enough so that it doesn't have a significant impact on night vision uh, on overnight passages. I think that, as I said earlier, I think that um, tablets and smartphones uh, and laptops 
have been a game changer in the navigation market. Uh, they've helped put downward pressure on truck water costs. Um, they're great below, they're great in your bunk uh, so that you can keep track of what's going on when somebody else is on watch. I person, and this is now opinion and not fact, um, my opinion, uh, they're not really there yet for your primary navigation in the cockpit. Um, that's, that's my opinion. Okay, so satellite phones, um, Iridium is really the only one that's got completely global coverage. So if you're planning to go to Antarctica or the Barents Sea um, or do the Northwest Passage, Iridium is really your only choice. We're not going anywhere, and that, and there's some um, confidence that's that can be associated with that. They do on-orbit processing, uh, which means that that things can be a little slower to be updated uh, when there's a uh, an advance in compression or something, because they have to do a rollout plan that goes uh, to a update all of the satellites so that they don't have the satellites uh, at running different versions of software. Uh, Global Star is also a low Earth orbit satellite. Uh, it's, it's at a, a, a higher angle and so they don't they don't do high latitudes well at all. Um, they ran into some financial issues and the Constellation uh, uh, started to, to deteriorate. Uh, they're they're doing a lot better. Um, they have from a from an engineering elegance point of view, their approach of a bent pipe is is really appealing because they just take a whole big chunk of frequencies, uh, like the cell phone uh, booster that I talked about. And, and send them straight back down to Earth. That means that all the software updates happen on the ground. And, and that's a little more convenient. Uh, Inmarsat is geostationary satellites. So their high latitude coverage is really kind of poor. Uh, they also do on-orbit processing. Um, really not a big player in the um, um, in the consumer satellite market where, where we sit. Uh, Thuraya is a pretty big deal in um, the Eastern Hemisphere. Uh, limited high latitude coverage, geostationary satellites, uh, but really attractive price points and some pretty cool hardware. They've got a sleeve that you can drop your iPhone into uh, and it turns it, your iPhone into a satellite phone. And, and that makes, uh, makes training a, a lot easier. Uh, I'm just checking questions again. Okay, so um, you gotta spend money on, on, the, on your satellite phone uh, every month with a service contract. Uh, it's the least expensive for for new long range equipment. Uh, it's, it's like buying a car when as soon as you drive off the lot, it, the value drops a good bit. They actually uh, are down about the same prices as used HF single sideband on the used market. Uh, one of the big attractions is it's one to one. You dial a number and you get the person you're trying to talk to or their voicemail. And somebody else dials your number and they talk to you. The downside is that it's one-to-one -one and you, you only get the person that you're talking to. So if you're in trouble somewhere on single sideband radio, you're not only gonna get the Coast Guard or whoever the search and rescue people are um, where you happen to be, but pretty much everybody else in earshot who's got a radio uh, is also gonna be there. And very often those are the folks, first folks who are gonna show up. Uh, satellite phones are banned 
Um, um, and the running costs really can add up. So if, if you're doing a, if your plan is for a five year circumnavigation, then um, satellite phones can get pretty expensive. If you go the satellite phone route, um, you, you really need to get what they what they sell as a car kit. It's a it's a fixed installation uh, system with a uh, uh, external antenna, uh, power supply, um, and connection for data, and all the cables to get everything talking to each other, speaker phone, all that kind of stuff. Um, it, you, you're just, you're just um, putting things off if you don't do that from the beginning. The Iridium Go, which is on the lower left-hand side, um, a nice piece of kit. A lot of, of realities that I think people don't necessarily recognize. Um, the voice performance is mediocre. And um, everybody on, that's connected to it, so you, you, it doesn't really, you can use it by itself over the display, but it's really hard. Um, so the, the real market niche there is, is that you connect to it with your smartphone, and uh, and you can do uh, texting and and all kinds of other things like that. Um, uh, the problem is you all share the same phone number. So the if you've got three people on the boat or four people on the boat, whoever reads the text message first uh, gets the text message, and the and it gets marked as read, and, and so. You know, you've got to make sure that everybody's going to say, hey, I got a text message from Frank and he wanted you to know um, whatever. Uh, so there's some inconveniences there. Uh, in my opinion, the, the drivers for satellite phone are, um, are direct dial. And if, if you have a really time sensitive uh, business or investment issues, or if you've got dependents ashore with medical issues, then a satellite phone makes a lot of sense. If, if you can take care of, of your shoreside needs um, by, um, satellite, by uh, cellular phones and Wi-Fi, and, and then let everybody know that you're gonna be out of touch for three days or four days between um, the BVI and and Martinique, or that um, you're going to be offline for two weeks between uh, Bermuda and uh, and the Azores. Uh, not clear to me that the 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 economics current currently today makes sense. Starlink could make a big difference here. Um, uh, uh, Iridium Next might make a big difference here but but today um, my thinking is uh, unless you've got real solid direct dial requirements um, it's probably not the right answer one of the arguments that comes up fairly often is um, uh, well I can't take a, a single sideband radio with me into the life raft uh, and I think that's specious um, the the priority in the life raft is an EPIRB. Uh, it's a certified life safety device that um, that gets uh, search and rescue coming to get you. Uh, your second priority is a handheld VHF radio, so that when um, uh, a ship comes, or fixed wing aircraft comes, or a helicopter comes. You can be part of the team deciding who goes off first and, and how to get off. And, and do you have one person with a medical emergency who needs to be airlifted or do you have a boat that's sinking? You, you want to be part of the decision-making process and, and you get that with VHF. Um, be nice if you had a charging capability for that handheld VHF. B2 
the only real benefit of a satellite phone uh, in a life graph is for morale. Um, if, if you don't have an EPIRB, um, you're really a, kind of a problem because people, you, who, whatever phone number you call, um, somebody's got to call somebody else, people are writing numbers down, people make mistakes, um, n not a good choice in, in my opinion. So n that is not justification for a satellite phone. Uh, uh, EPIRB's yet another radio, so it is communication. Um, it uses a, a 400 megahertz distress beacon that goes to a satellite. Uh, and, and most of them these days, I don't know of any that don't have their own built-in GPS. So they transmit who you are, where you are, and that you need help like right now. Um, there's a, a registration page when you do an EPIRB that has um, um, emergency contact information on it so that they can call somebody and say, we've just got an emergency beacon from whoever you are. Um, are they actually at sea? And, and then they start really scrambling assets when somebody says yes. Um, you can get a, a personal locator beacon as an option. They're smaller, they're a little cheaper. Uh, the biggest difference is that uh, the battery life on them uh, when they're activated is a day as opposed to two days for the EPIRB. Um, uh, one thing that is sort of related here, uh, there's a search and rescue transmitter that uses AIS, uh, which is, is worth giving some thought to. Uh, it does not do satellite. Uh, it just does local VHF. AIS, um, the, the appeal to me, the attraction to me is that the, um, the people who are most likely to come fish me out of the water are the people who are in VHF range. <laughs> and so that's really, really attractive because you fall in, you hit the button, some of them are, are, are water activated and, and there's gonna be alarm on every single boat in the area that's got AIS uh, and they'll, they're the ones who are going to be fastest on site. So I'm running, I'm running late already or I would tell you yet another story. Trackers are really helpful. They make people at home feel really good uh, about they know that you, where you are. Um, Spot has the little orange ones. Garmin uh, sells the inReach. Um, uh, there are other less well-known alternatives, but Spot and InReach are really the 800-pound gorillas. Um, uh, TV afloat, uh, over-the-air satellite costs a good bit. The little K KVH uh, domes with fire control systems in them work really, really well. Um, there are some that only do uh, azimuth and don't do elevation. You have to manually set the elevation. Follow Me TV is probably the best known of those. Uh, if you've got a satellite um, TV subscription from somebody like uh, Direct TV, uh, it, it's worth noting that uh, the local channels are, can be hard to to organize. Um, so it, it really helps to have uh, a, a a working address that you can use in a very big region like New York City or Los Angeles in order to be able to get that. Uh, if you do data and you can get data that's fast enough, um, then a lot of people do cord cutting and Netflix, Amazon Prime, Hulu. Uh, there are some geographical restrictions there. Um, if you are, have a Netflix account, the movies that you can see, the TV shows that you can see when you're in the US are likely to be different than the ones that you can see if you're in the UK or the Eastern Caribbean um, due to copyright limitations. I want to take just a minute and talk about weather. Um, uh, the NOAA VHF weather broadcast is, is obviously there. Uh, this is, the next one here is not meant to be funny. It's true. You can call someone at home. I have people who call me and, and say, Dave, you know, I just can't get something. What, 
what does the weather look like to you? So if you've got sailing colleagues um, that are, are good at weather and, and good at the internet, you know, they've got a lot of options that you don't have at sea. Um, commercial weather routers are available. Um, I'm a big fan of Chris Parker. He's a personal friend, so um, I may not be completely objective there, but he does a great job on the U.S. East Coast and the Eastern Caribbean. Um, Commander's weather is another option. Uh, excuse me, hiccups. Um, there are voice broadcasts on HF and single sideband from NOAA and the Coast Guard working together. Uh, Shipcom is what used to be AT&T High Seas Radio uh, that you uh, may well have seen in, in old John Wayne war movies. Uh, the owner of Shipcom passed away a year or so ago, and they're kind of scrambling to get themselves back online. Uh, but I have every expectation that they will recover. And other countries have things too. Um, uh, UK Met has got absolutely great weather from Northwood. And, and even on, on BBC, the shipping report is, is good weather. Uh, Deutsche Welle has um, good weather from the, the German uh, me uh, meteorological uh, service. Uh, over email, uh, you can do, you can get GRIBS. I'm not a big fan of GRIBS. I'm going to tell you why here in just a second. Uh, and you can absolutely positively do weather facts, um, synoptic charts. I'm going to show you a sample of that. And, uh, and again, we already talked about using a portable shortwave receiver and, a, and software like JVCOM32. So here is, on the left is a GRIB. And on the right is a synoptic chart for exactly the wind and wave forecast for the, for the same time. And, and if you look, you can see that there's a fair amount of difference between those two things. And the reason that there's a difference is that GRIBs come out of a computer model completely untouched by human hand. And, uh, uh, and they make some assumptions in order to be able to generate the data in a, in a timely fashion. And some of those assumptions are wrong and we know they're wrong. And with enough training, you can look at GRIBS and see where things are. But, but in this case, um, the professional meteorologists who looked at computer model data, not just one model, but a number of models. And they also look at something called ensembles that are running the same model over and over again with different input data, because we know we know the input data is um, um, is wrong. We just don't know how wrong it is. So in, in this particular case, we had uh, this this very deep cold front driven by a very deep uh, low pressure system. We have a moderate low pressure system here, uh, dragging another low and a big cold front and uh, and then there's a, a gale by a moderately low uh, low there. And then down here in the middle and the bottom is Hurricane Daniel, which doesn't even show up on the grips because it's, it's so deep and so concentrated that the computer model just smooths over it. This is just a single example of why I, uh, uh, I really like the the meteorologist value added synoptic chart that you can get over uh, over weather facts much better than than a grip. Okay, so uh, lots of choices here. Um, they're interrelated. When you make one choice, that may have an impact on, on what's uh, achievable in other areas. Uh, radio physics drives what's practical. We talked about that a little bit when we talk about Starlink and what the difference might be between performance at 30,000 feet and performance at sea level. Uh, no matter how deep your wallet is, cost is always a factor. Um, and so you, you need to look at fixed and variable costs. What do I need to spend now, potentially while I'm still working? 
and and what do I need to spend on an ongoing basis when potentially don't have a revenue stream coming in anymore. Uh, selling profile drives need. What that means is that what what's appropriate for you if you are doing the ICW as a snowbird and spending a couple of three months in the in the Bahamas every winter uh, is going to be different from uh, somebody who's going around below. Um, permanent installation uh, brings huge performance gains and, th and this is particularly the case for satellite communications but I would argue that it also applies to things like do I want to use an iPad for um, for primary navigation and and what we would build and I really mean we what would you build or I build if we were starting from scratch and designing something uh, may not be available and so what what's available commercial off the shelf uh, is going to drive our decision making and in fact drive the architecture for how things talk to other things on your boat so you might uh, draw, draw a nice picture of how you would like things to work and then find that it's either um, not available at all or it's um, it's too expensive or it's got other issues like fragility uh, failure modes so what you can actually buy may cause you to circle back and and rethink how you're going to do things on your boat uh, I said this earlier I'm gonna say it again get off the dock and go sailing there's absolutely positively nothing better than going sailing to make you smart to make you ask better questions to make you more clear about what your priorities are um, Uh, and and you may find that things that you think because you've been reading um, too much Lynn Pardee, too much Beth Leonard, too much Nigel Calder, um, all of whom are really good people and really smart, but but they make underlying assumptions that may not be the same as what you um, are going to do. Um, get off the dock and get smart and ask better questions and question the pundits, question me, um, uh, question conventional wisdom, uh, don't allow yourself to confuse fact with opinion. Um, and sometimes you have to dig, especially when you're looking at yourself. Don't trust anyone, including yourself. <laughs> so you, you may have to poke at yourself a little bit say okay I'm making an assumption here that that doesn't seem to stand up to your boat it's your priorities um, not just day sales uh, when I do uh, insurance check checklist um, trips based here out of Annapolis I very often will uh, use as a as a final exam for the boat owners who, who need a sign off from their insurance company uh, we'll leave Annapolis and sail down to Little Creek uh, near Norfolk, Virginia and go around 1LC and come straight back. No, no stops either way. Um, takes a, a little less than two days on most boats. Um, the Delmarva um, circuit um, up, up the Chesapeake Bay through the C&D Canal, down the Delaware Bay, along the Virginia um, coast, back up the Chesapeake Bay. That's a great way to, to get some experience. And you can do that if you don't stop. You can do that in a long weekend. You can do that three days. Uh, Norfolk to Bermuda is four days. And that's a great shakedown for yourself, for a, um, your annual or semi-annual uh, vacation to, uh, to make sure that, that the things you think are important are really important. You, you may find that uh, some techno wizard thing that you thought was important is less important than squeezing another uh, 60 or 70 gallons of water onto the boat. Uh, Newport to Cape May is a good one. Um, around Long Island is a good one. Um, Newport to Bermuda is a good one. And, and again, repeating myself on purpose because it's important. Get off the dock 
go sailing because you can get services and stuff pretty much anywhere. The logistics may change, but, but you can do it. Okay, so that's what I have to offer this evening. I'm sorry I hung, hang, hung on to you guys for a little longer than planned. Um, if, uh, okay, so Scott asked, oh, uh, Scott asked a zombie apocalypse question. Um, so that's, that's like fine. He's a great way to wrap things up, you know? <laughs> right. It's a, it's, a, it's a good way. Um, so uh, first place deliveries in, I, I do a lot of research before I go, particularly in, in this time. Uh, and for all of the states that I had to go through from New Bern, North Carolina, uh, through North Carolina, through Virginia, through part of Maryland to um, uh, Solomon's, Maryland, uh, uh, delivery counts as transportation infrastructure and not as mm -hmm. recreational boating. So you, you're allowed to bring the boat home is kind of what it comes down to. And this particular boat was one that shortly before the coronavirus hit, uh, my customer bought. And then <clears throat> the boat was stuck down there. So he, um, uh, he found me and, and I had got all the paperwork in, uh, in hand so that in case we did get stopped by somebody and, and that did not happen. Um, I had all my, my ducks in a row. It was a pretty nice trip, um, all things considered. Um, okay, John asked about the Garmin inReach marine weather feature. That's, that's a single point grib data uh, packet. So it, it says the computer model all by itself, untouched by human hands, says at this latitude and longitude, Tomorrow afternoon at, at two o'clock, um, this is what you can expect. And, uh, and the problem, particular, particularly uh, in the Atlantic, um, less, a little less so in the Pacific, is that we're so dominated by cold fronts and, and the computer models don't do a good job of that. And, and so um, the, the inReach, Crib spot reports are, are better than nothing, but the error rate is fairly high. I, I would, with, without having data that I can point to, I would say 30%. And, and, and the, the irony is that there's a tendency for us to say, well, you know, meteorologists are the only people who can be wrong half the time and still keep their jobs. And in, and in this case with GRIBS, and, and the inReach is a GRIB, um, uh, the meteorologists aren't involved. It just comes right out of the computer and, and, and shows up on your device. Uh, John, you just keep helping me. You really do. Um, <laughs> see that? He's like our behind the scenes uh, panelist. I like he it. Is. <laughs> uh, and he's, uh, I will introduce you Josh, I will introduce you to John. He's a really good guy. Um, he is a character, uh, much as I am a character. <laughs> so so you, you, you need to tolerate us a little bit. Well, uh, if you vouch for him, all right, I suppose he's got to be okay. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, um, so, yes, yeah, Scott, I went to Solomon's, Maryland. Uh, no, I went actually went across the river from Spring Cove uh, to uh, the – um, uh, West Basin Marina, which is part of the uh, Patuxent River Naval Air Station uh, um, MWR. Um, I think we got 56 people, Dirk. Yeah, um, I think we had a pretty good turnout here, uh, Dave, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna end your screen share here. And I'm going to bring up, uh, I know I've been hiding out in the back here. So there we are. Um, but yeah, Dave, you know, I really want to just say thanks. I mean, what a phenomenal presentation. I mean, we ran long, but I wasn't even about to jump in here because you were on a roll. Um, 
Yeah, this was a this was a lot of fun, and you definitely offer a lot of insight, knowledge, and a blend of experience that uh, that I think can only come from someone with your background. So you definitely you've been there, you've done that, you've got the T-shirt, and uh, you're so generous and uh, gracious with your your knowledge and expertise. Uh, I know we appreciate it, and I know everybody else that was tuning in here certainly does as well. Um, and for anybody who tuned in, I, I put Dave's contact information there in the chat. I'll also include it in the follow-up to this webinar. Uh, we'll make sure we get Dave's slides in there and some links to the uh, to some of the information that uh, that uh, we had shared today. So, um, yeah. With that, uh, Dave, you have any parting words? I, I just want to thank you, Josh, and uh, and David Walters Yachts uh, for. Uh, taking the initiative to set up this webinar series uh, and I'd like to uh, point everybody if you go to David Walters yachts.com and and go under um, it's like keeping up or something like that to yeah. current events yep you can, you can see all the other events that that they've got lined up and I highly recommend Friday afternoon happy hour <laughs> Yeah, we've been having a lot of fun with our happy hour every Friday from, uh, yeah, from four to six. So, yeah, we're going to be keeping these webinars going uh, for the foreseeable future. It's been a lot of fun. We've picked them some great topics, had some great uh, guests sharing their experience. So, join us. Uh, join us again. We'll we'll be putting out the schedule here for future webinars. And uh, just want to say thanks again uh, to Dave. Um, John, our background panelist, and, uh, and, and to you guys uh, for tuning in. So, again, thanks so much. Take care, everybody. Good night, John. Josh. <laughs> Good night. Sorry. Tired. <laughs> I know. You had a long day. <laughs>